Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is February the 12th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and when we were last together, we discussed the 10 plagues and their implications unto the people of Egypt. And at this point in our story, the Egyptians have had enough, and so the Exodus begins. And that's where we're going to begin today in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 31. Now it says, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night. Remember, all the Egyptians woke up in the middle of the night because they realized the firstborn of both man and beast had been killed. And so Pharaoh immediately calls Moses and Aaron unto him that night. And he says, rise up, get you forth from among my people. That is a very severe statement. It's very stern in the way that Pharaoh says it. Get out of here. Leave now. At once. We can handle no more destruction. Now you must at this point go back and think about the ten plagues. Because as you now look back in each of the ten plagues, the result of those plagues is throughout the land of Egypt. There is so much devastation, so much stench so much death, so much destruction littering the streets of Egypt that they are well aware of God's mighty hand upon them and they don't even want to try to imagine or fathom what God would do next. If he were to kill all the firstborn, his next step would be to kill everyone in Egypt. And so Pharaoh says unto them, go, serve the Lord as you have said. Whatever you want to do, do it. Just leave my people and leave my land. Take everything that you own. Take your flocks and your herds. But notice what Pharaoh says in verse 32. Before you go, bless me. Remove this curse from me and my people and bless me. And it says in verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent upon the people. The children of Israel could not leave quick enough, for they said to themselves, we be all dead men. And so the children of Israel took their dough before it was leavened. Notice, before it was leavened, they took their kneading troughs bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. Now, if you were to look up that word borrowed in the Strong's Concordance, you'll see that it has many meanings. But one of the meanings is that they demanded of the people jewels of silver, jewels of gold, raiment and clothing for their journey. And Yahweh, the Lord, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they did give them all that they demanded, all that they asked, all that they required. And so they spoiled the Egyptians. They looted the Egyptians. They took everything from them. Now there were about 600,000 that were men beside children and beside women. So we approximate over a million people left Egypt of the children of Israel, not counting the Egyptians. And that's what it says in the next verse. It says a mixed multitude went up also with them. Now, Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, speaks about that mixed multitude. It says in verse 4, the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. The mixed multitude that came out with the people of Israel, because they had seen the mighty hand of God, and they knew that Yahweh was mightier than the gods they served in Egypt, and so they chose to serve the true and living mighty God, and yet when they got out into the wilderness, after leaving Egypt, they fell a lusting. And the children of Israel began to weep as they began to weep. And they said, who will give us flesh to eat? They're in the wilderness. They are hungry. 
All they have is manna to eat, and they're longing for the things that they left behind them. In verse 5, it says, we remember the fish that we had when we were in Egypt. We remember the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And these things seemed more pleasant to them than the manna that God was giving them. And the reason for that is the food that they had in Egypt was a momentary pleasure. It was good to the taste bud, but the manna was a sustaining pleasure. It would always be there as long as the people trust in God. And we too should learn from this, friends, because there's many things in this world that this life offers us that is a momentary pleasure. But we don't rest in the momentary pleasure. We rest in the sustaining pleasure, the presence of the Lord Jesus, his spirit in our lives, the fruit of his spirit, which is joy, peace, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and other such holy attributes. And these sustain us over time, even in the most desperate and darkest of times. One can get drunk, but he will sober up. One can get high, but he will come down. But the fruit of the Spirit, especially love, joy, and peace, reside within us. They're a continuous pleasure that we can enjoy. And they never leave us as long as we rest and abide in our Lord. And so again, in verse 38, it says, a mixed multitude went out with them. Now, notice in verse 39, the children of Israel baked unleavened cakes of dough to take with them on their journey, but it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt. They were thrown out so quickly that they didn't even have time to prepare proper meals for themselves. Well, in the remaining verses, God is going to give instruction as to how the Passover is to be performed, in the second verse of chapter 13, God says, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, both of man and beast, it is mine. And then in verse 17, we enter into the crossing of the Red Sea. Now the people are in Egypt, they're going to make their way to the Red Sea, and it's important that they cross the Red Sea because once God closes that up, there is no possible way to return unto Egypt. Had they not crossed the Red Sea, it would always be in their mind that if times became desperate enough, they could return unto the comfort and safety of Egypt. And so we pick up in verse 17, and it says, It came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. And isn't that how it is with us, friends, as young Christians, when we realize the difficulty in serving Christ, when we realize all the hardship that comes from following him, we seek to go back to the easy way, to our old lifestyle, and instead what we should do is we should press in deeper. We should fight harder. Well, it says in verse 18, God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Now, do you remember when Joseph died? He said, when you leave this place, because God has told Abraham that you will be in bondage for 400 years, but when you leave take my bones with you. Well, that's what we see in verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you will carry up my bones away hence with you. And if you've forgotten this, you'll find it in Genesis chapter 50, somewhere around verse 24, 25. Well, now God has brought them out of Egypt, but he hasn't left them there. He is with them. He is traveling with them. And so here is another symbolic picture of our Christian lives, friends, because when we begin our journey with the Lord, after our experience of being set free from the bondage that we were in, God is with us. He has promised that he would never leave us. He would never forsake us. 
And so if we will only look to his strength, his guidance, his direction, his protection, our way will be much easier because we will not be fighting this battle alone. And it says in verse 21, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So he does with us, friends. He leads us and he gives us light even when we're surrounded in a world of darkness. And just as in verse 22, he did not take away the pillar of cloud, nor the fire by night, nor will he us, friends. Again, he has promised he would never leave us nor forsake us. He is ever present simply at the mention of his name. And if we will only whisper that precious name in our most difficult of times, we will find a peace that will come over us that will truly fill us with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Well, we're going to close there today, friends. And the next time together, we'll pick up at chapter 14. In the meantime, I would encourage you to reflect on this story and discover for yourself how these real life events that were taking place in the lives of the people of Israel in this time some 4,000 years ago, is especially relevant and symbolic to your Christian life that you are living and walking each and every day. And remind yourself, the same God that delivered the people of Israel from Egypt, from bondage, so too has he delivered you from your bondage. And now he walks with you. He talks with you. He leads and guides you. And he takes no pleasure in your looking back, no pleasure in what you left behind. And regardless of all the hardship that is between you and the promised land, your eyes are upon the promised land. That is your goal. That is your destination. And you'll let nothing get in the way of your arrival to the land and to your king, hallelujah, that awaits you. Well, now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.